Welcome to Global Connections. I'm Dr. Gregory Gatiss, Associate Professor of Political Science at Hawaii Pacific University, and my co-host here is Dr. Phil King, a Professor of Political uh, Emeritus of um, Political Psychology at Hawaii Pacific University here. Uh, Dr. King and I have uh, been colleagues for 40 years. Uh, he has a distinguished past. He was a graduate of Grinnell College and a Master's in Psychology from University of Pennsylvania and a PhD from political science in political science at the University of Hawaii. I was at Bowling Green for my bachelor, uh, bachelor's and master's degree and my PhD in political science at the same time. Uh, Dr. King, uh, our presentation here today has to do with the uh, imminent collapse of civilization. I know it sounds really uh, overwhelming, but in fact we've been working on this for 40 years. When we were graduate students back at the University of Hawaii. We uh, debated many times about all the problems that were about us, uh, the disappearing ozone layer and overpopulation and on and on. And nobody in the faculty was doing that. They're doing mindless games like game theory with card tricks and stuff like that to get published. And we instituted a non-trivial memo series. We sent two of them out. You sent one that I went on, then some Henry Carriel chided us. And then we realized, hey, wait a minute, these guys have to give us our PhD. We better not irritate them anymore. So we still are concerned about these great momentous problems that the world has that we were trying to figure out how to solve. And uh, among them that have transpired since then, I'm just going to give you a quick list of possible threats that could bring about this end of civilization. Of course, one is overpopulation and mass starvation if, if there was a... If there was a severe drought and there wasn't adequate food, uh, electromagnetic pulse from either the sun, which comes every 150 years, and we're due to have one in, by 2020, according to, one in eight chance, according to the scientists, uh, which would be very bad for frying our electric grid. Uh, financial collapse is really scary, the way that Japan and Europe and the United States is printing money and trying to keep it afloat, and we have a sense that the whole thing could really collapse. It could be a house of cards. We seem prosperous, all of us, but we could uh, go under. Uh, trade wars could happen. We could wind up like the Hootsmalley Tariff in 1920s, in which they led to the Great Depression. Climate change, of course, can bring about a lot of these things, and we also have long-term fossil fuel problem to sustain this um, highly sophisticated, highly advanced technological system that came with us for the Industrial Revolution. Now, you and I have been talking about this in various ways, and we were, our interest was first lit, I guess, by Gregory Bateson, who is uh, outside of political science. We started looking for people outside political science for guidance in life, and he was a genius who had done many things, anthropology, psychology. The last thing he did was cybernetics. After World War II, he and Margaret Mead and those had a conference. And he came up with information theory and the idea that everything is related. And if you can't just do one thing. If you do something to solve a problem, you might solve that, but have a lot of other problems that follow from that. So he was very pessimistic about humans' ability to uh, solve our problems. So. I once said to him in desperation, well, what can we do? What can we do? And, uh, and he said, well, you can't do anything. In fact, he said, we once, we once had a conference in which the people were divided. Since it's all going to collapse, should we do it? Should we precipitate it now? Should we sabotage society now and collapse sooner so the damage isn't so great, so we have 4 million people instead of 8 million people, or should we let it bleed? And half the people were for sabotaging it, and half the people were for letting it bleed. So, whoa, this is heavy stuff. So we spent a lot of our time arguing about these things, and we need to have some clarity on it. We need to share this with other people. And uh, I'd like to turn to you 
to see what, how you see the problem. What do you think the central problem is? And in later shows, we can actually try to solve these problems. But today, we should just alert people to the problems. But what do you see as the major problem? Well, first of all, Dr. Gator, it's a pleasure to be here with you and to resume our conversation that we started, was it 46 years ago? Yeah. It seems like 46 say days. 40. We sound so old if it's 46. That's right. <laughs> Um, I recall that when we first, in, we first uh, grasped the homeless problem and tried to make some sense out of it, um, since that time, the population of the planet has more than doubled. The population of the United States is up 60%, and the population of Hawaii has nearly doubled. So whatever problems existed then have been exacerbated and exist even greater now. I personally think the main driving factor, which has been called the master variable in all this, is in fact un uh, burgeoning and uncontrolled population growth. Because with population growth, you get a greater demand for the use of resources, mm. more pollution, more complexity in society, mm. and it's really out of control. Think, think of rabbits on an island. Mm -hmm. a, the, an island can maybe sustain a certain number of rabbits. Mm -hmm. If you double the number of rabbits on an island and then double them again, mm -hmm. Eventually, the finite mass mm -hmm. of that island will, mm -hmm. cannot contain the increasing mm -hmm. infinite number of rabbits. Mm -hmm. It's that simple on one level. However, it's a completely very complex problem because, as you mentioned in your introduction, everything is connected to everything else. And if we, have, if we extract more resources, then we deplete non-renewable resources. Mm -hmm. I, I recall there's that right now in Florida, they're deepening the channel around Miami mm -hmm. so that bigger tankers can carry more oil in and out of Florida, and that destroys the reef in Florida, which mm -hmm. destroys the sea life, which mm -hmm. destroys the oceans. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to avoid doing damage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, back in 1969, this, these were considered problems, very serious problems, but problems amenable to solution. Mm -hmm. If only, for example, people would have, on the average, two kids per family, mm -hmm. which would lead over time to a stable uh, world population. Mm -hmm. But since th the world population has doubled since then, two children per family will no longer do the trick. Well, now we need really one child per family um, over about three generations. That would be, a, hypothetically, a very benign way to get the world down to a sustainable level of people. Uh, many of the analysts I've read talk about two billion being the level of people that the, the planet could sustain at a lifestyle comparable to European lifestyles. Mm. European lifestyles are very good, perhaps a tad lower than the United States lifestyle because we have all these needs for transportation. We have a bigger country. But that would certainly be a very agreeable lifestyle mm -hmm. for all the people on the planet. Unfortunately, we don't have two billion people on the planet. We have seven and a half approaching eight and heading toward ten. Mm -hmm. So that's, in essence, is the problem, and we could be talking about this for hours and hours, but we'll, we'll try to, I'll try to respond to your questions mm -hmm. and talk more about um, a, a basic overview of, of mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, I just saw in the paper yesterday, this is out of the Star Advertiser of all things here, and the little headline is, 400,000 kids in Nigeria at risk of starvation, UN warns. Well, you know what that means. It means that the UN's going to come to us and be compassionate, give food, and of course we will, as we always have. Sure, here we'll feed those kids. Those kids will survive. But remember, we taught a course, Social 100, in which the economic, it was different social sciences for economics, we chose this one famine in Africa. And it was interesting, they had a famine like in 1970, and all these millions of people were going to starve, except we rushed in food, saved them. And then seven years later, 77, they had another famine but now we have twice as many people, but we have to rush in food and save them. And I just was noticing uh, yest uh, last week that there was, oh, Ethiopians, they're, are, uh, they're starving again. And I realized what we have is what Bateson talked about, schismogenesis, or a runaway system, so that if there's a problem, people are there, they're overpopulated, but we rush in and give them food, they survive. We give them medicine, they survive. So now they have twice as many of them, but they have eight kids. And then suddenly they... Uh, exceed the carrying capacity of their, of their uh, soil, and they can't produce the food for that. We have to rush in again. So each time we rush in to save something, in Bateson's terms, we just increase it, and it's like a runaway system. It's like your car is going faster, and there's no, nothing, there's no governor to, to 
keep it in place. And one governor that you suggested was limit population, two per family or perhaps one per family. So uh, I'm agree with you that long term. Um, when is this going to hit? What's your projection? How long do we have uh, to solve this if we, you're going to solve it? Well, um, what was a problem in 1969 when we first started studying this has now turned into, in, in Greer's terms, a predicament. A problem is amenable to solution. A predicament is something you just have to adjust to and live with. I think it's highly unlikely that the world as a whole will adopt an average of one-child families. But that would be a benign way to uh, reduce population to sustainable levels. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a computer, a very famous computer simulation done at MIT in 1970. And it led to a book called The Limits to Growth mm -hmm. by Dennis and Dal Danella Meadows and a number of other researchers. And what they did is they took some major variables such as um, population growth, resource use, depletion of resources, malnutrition, uh, global, global pollution, and so forth. And they put all sorts of assumptions about how these factors interrelate and interact with each other. Then they would run their model out and to see what would happen. And they, ch they varied the assumptions in the model. Oh, we have so much agricultural pr productivity. Oh, we can double that or cut it in half. We have so much pollution or less. And whatever model they, whatever changes they made to the model, what happened was a die off, a, 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 a die off of world population mm -hmm. by the year, by 100 years from when they did the model, which was 1970. Mm -hmm. So by 2070, well within the lifetime of many, many people currently alive, this would be happen. This would be a bad way to reduce population mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there would just be a die off. Mm -hmm. Too many rabbits on the island, mm -hmm. the rabbits starve and mm -hmm. they die off. Mm -hmm. So the alternative to that bad solution would be a deliberate, benign, decision mm -hmm. by human beings mm -hmm. to limit family size. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened yet. The world's leaders have been utterly derelict in, mm -hmm. in, a, in the fact that they've ignored this problem mm -hmm. entirely. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows what's going to happen. I, it, it doesn't look good, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Well, how about this? Uh, some people say that with industrialization and wealth, people naturally choose smaller families so that my grandparents might have had six or seven children. My parents had four children. I don't happen to have any children. Um, our, our generation, we have no children or one children or two children, at least among our colleagues at the university. Um, so it becomes so expensive to have children that people have less. Now, this has happened in the United States. It's happened in Japan. It's happened in Europe. Is this a solution to, over time, that as people get wealthy, it, the problem will go away on its own. In principle, yes, but all I can say is too little, too late. This is known as a demographic shift. If you get, if people become more wealthy and become industrialized, they do tend to have smaller families, but too little, too late. Mm -hmm. uh, this might have been a, a good coping mechanism 50 years ago, 80 years ago, mm -hmm. but um, unfortunately, there's still a number of of countries and societies that produce lots of kids. The, as you noted, the United States, if left to only natural increase, would be even, with the population would be even or maybe declining mm -hmm. slightly. Mm -hmm. But because we want cheap labor, mm -hmm. we have a lot of immigration, mm -hmm. which means that the United States population has gone up. It's mm -hmm. gone up 60% mm -hmm. just in the time since we've been uh, thinking about this problem in, in the late 1960s. Yeah, that's shocking. The, uh think that there's 1 billion in 1800 and then 2 billion in 1860 or something like that and then after 60 years and then 3 billion after 30 years and now it's just it's just going up an exponential curve yes and uh, as you say it's, it has to be brought down rationally through choice or through collapse of some sort of starve, starve yeah. off which would could come about uh, what would precipitate this what do you think would precipitate this starve off? When would we suddenly, uh oh, we don't have enough food anymore? Like if we don't have enough food here, if we don't have this great bread basket, because actually North America, United States and Canada feeds the world. We're the ones with the two big, oh, I think Australia also does, is in there too, has surplus grain to go around the world. But if something were to happen to our water, let's say, uh, the irrigation under the 
a lot of uh, uh, aquifer there, for example, in Nebraska and all that. I think that only runs 20 years. Right now, it's sprinkling and ice and giving us all these green crops and everything. But if that ran out in 20 years and we don't have that anymore, uh, what are we going to do? What's the solution to this? Uh, well, first of all, it's hard to know when various elements of collapse will occur. Mm -hmm. We, it's almost dead certain that they will occur, but whether something happens in five years or 10 or 15 or 20 mm -hmm. or 50 mm -hmm. is a bit indeterminate. I, I like to think of the old metaphor of a camel and the straw that breaks the camel's back. Mm -hmm. If you start loading pieces of straw one mm -hmm. at a time on a camel, eventually that camel's gonna collapse. Mm -hmm. Will its back break, as in the old uh, metaphor? Or will its knees give out? Will its heart give out? Will its lungs give out? We don't know. But we know that you can't pile an infinite number of pieces of straw on the back of a finite camel. It will give way. Already we're seeing things like the rise of sea level, which is predicted <coughs> to be 6.6 .6 feet. Uh, the oceans will rise mm -hmm. by the year 2100, by mm -hmm. the end of this century. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that, that, what, will that, that will, what that will do to Miami, New York, mm -hmm. Boston, mm -hmm. L.A., mm -hmm. San Francisco, and places in Europe like Rotterdam, which mm -hmm. is already under, the, under sea level? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. Everything is so interdependent. Mm -hmm. Things are, not, are universalized and not regionalized. If the grid goes down, it can go down for an entire state or mm -hmm. half the country. Mm -hmm. What would be a rational solution or preventive step taken to prevent some of these catastrophes is to have things much more local, local and regional, have town-based electrical grids rather than state or national-based mm -hmm. electrical grids, mm -hmm. have agricultural production close to where people need, uh, eat the food, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Yes, uh, these are all great thoughts here, uh, and I'm hoping that we can all digest these. It's and have a, what Basin called a drop in the population in such a way that the survivors are in an untraumatized state, but it's hard to believe they could do that if people are starving and if there's actually going to be uh, people mobbed going around with guns, going after each other's food and things like that. It could be rather ugly. So rational is the choice. That's, that's what we should be doing. Um, so let's hope that we're capable of thinking that way. The um, other topics that we're going to have, have to think about here that might precipitate this, because a lot of things can precipitate this, it could be, uh, as I said, that electromagnetic pulse from the sky and so forth. Um, that would, if it came, would fry the electric grid. They say that the North American electric grid is the greatest invention of man. It's the most spectacular thing, more than the pyramids or the Aswan Dam or anything else. And of course it's wonderful, but the problem is the more wonderful something is, the more efficient it is, the more grandiose it is, the more vulnerable it is to Precisely. collapse. Because it, it, any interruption with that, everything falls apart. I'm thinking of uh, back in Marblehead, Ohio, where I was from. Everybody had their own well. It was sort of a semi-rural area. And they, every, everyone's home is about 100 yards apart or half a mile apart or whatever. And everybody drilled their own well. Everybody had their own water. So if somebody's well went bad, it's okay. His well went bad, but everyone else still has water. Then Marble had put in city water. You want to link up? And everyone says, yeah, let's link up. So they linked up to the water. Uh, and that's fine. But what happens if something was wrong with that water? It got poisoned or it, it broke and it wasn't able to do it anymore send it out to you, the electric motor or whatever, suddenly everybody's without water. It's more efficient, that's good, but it's more vulnerable. And all of our computer systems are the same way. I mean, look at hacking into the, um, our Yahoo just had a billion people hacking in. What if they went in and disrupted things in some way? I don't know what they're going to do to the people's accounts or whatever, but it could be, it could be ridiculous. It could be awful. So it would, it would be rather dangerous. Uh, the, the more sophisticated we become. Because think of the brain. You've seen these, these uh, images of the brain on TV and they, you'll see the synapses firing off and all the in, in, bits of information going around. And there are billions of those. And that's what society is. And if you go in 
to, and cut the brain at some point and so forth and stop it, and that, you know, that's perhaps lethal to that person. Well, if you do that to society, cut the electronic grid, then nothing, nothing um, moves. There's no transportation. And so Ted Koppel, whom I know you know and respect, is a Nightline moderator for many years, wrote a book called Lights Out. And in this book, he said, if the, um, if the electronic grid grow, goes, now there's a couple ways it could go. One would be from an electronic magnetic pulse from the sun, which happens every 150 years, and we're due for one in the next eight years. Uh, that would be disastrous. Um, in fact, it's, it's so disastrous, we probably should hold off on this and, and save this, take a pause, and come back to it. Um, but at any rate, the bad fact I want to leave people with is 90% of the people would die within a year. This is from Ted Koppel saying we can't get the food to the people in the cities and people are going to starve. So we are extremely vulnerable to one little thing, the electronic grid going down. It can go down two ways, one from the sun, from these elect elect the solar storms, or it could be a nuclear weapon overhead from North Korea, let's say, or some crazy country, Iran, which explodes it and then fries the grid then we're in big trouble. I know in my own condo, for example, whenever there's a big rainstorm and electricity goes out, people can't get the elevators to the top floors. They, so we have a generator we start up, and that generator will use move one elevator, and that solves the problem. So people can get up or down. But imagine if it went out completely, and your generator runs out of gasoline, there's no way to get you gasoline. Imagine people living on the 40th store or the 140th store for talking about New York. No one's going to live there. No one's going to carry the water up. You can't even flush a toilet. The cities will depopulate. It'll, they're going to run out in the countryside looking for food. Farmers will say, no, no, no. It's gonna, it could be chaotic. So these kind of things can also sponsor this, these electromagnetic pulses, either from a nuclear blast overhead by the, um, some rogue enemy of ours, and the only two rogue enemies I know that would think of doing that would be North Korea and Iran. I think the Chinese and the Russians are too smart. They never, never pulled the trigger in like 40 years because they don't, they don't want to be destroyed. But some apocalyptic crazy man could do that sort of thing. So we'd really have to worry about that. I think that's one of the serious things. The other population things that you're talking about uh, could be just a slow death. It could be a slow... Um, starvation regionally in some areas and so forth. But if America went out, I mean, just think, we feed the world, and, and Canada does. Suddenly, uh, there's no food for anybody, no surplus food for anybody. So I'm a little worried about that. Just, not just, this, the, the problem is stopping the North Koreans and the Iranians. The predicament is the trying to stop the sun. You can't stop the sun's solar storm. If they're going to have a storm every, year, every 150 years, it's coming. Now, the last time it came was 1848, and at that time, the only electrical thing we had in the world was the telegraph, and those wires got fried and we couldn't use it. So you just replace it with new wires and got set up again in a week or a month. But if electronic grid goes, it's, and if they burn the transformers, that's disastrous. So. I would, I would really be worried about that. Um, and we ought to do something to harden our transformers or something. We're not doing anything. By the way, the only place that makes transformers is Germany and South Korea. So there's a limited supply of these transformers. We're not thinking ahead. We're not thinking about how to harden them or protect them in case of this uh, electronic pulse. So that would be my concern. Um, everything that you say is, is true. It would be nice if we'd be rational about population, but uh, until that time comes, um, we're going to be subject to these other things. Um, who, who else besides Bateson was a, uh, uh, a, um, a guru to you that led you to understand this? Well, there was a man named Garrett Hardin who wrote a seminal long article called The Tragedy of the Commons. I think that came out around 1970 as well. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out that the morality of any action, such as choosing your family size, mm -hmm. for example, is a matter of 
the state of the system in which the action takes place. So if we're talking about 1800 in frontier America, mm -hmm. to have six or eight children made eminent sense, mm -hmm. and it was a and it was a moral decision because mm -hmm. you had a open land with and many resources, and there wasn't there weren't these shortages. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of kids died died at very young or in childbirth mm -hmm. and, or uh, as as infants. Mm -hmm. But to have six or eight kids now. Is really an indulgence. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's an indulgence for your own ego. Mm -hmm. When you consider mm -hmm. the burden those mm -hmm. kids will have on the mm -hmm. planet and mm -hmm. the very mm -hmm. difficult life they're likely mm -hmm. to have, mm -hmm. young children today, anyone under mm -hmm. the age of thirty today, mm -hmm. let's say, is likely to have a very hard go of it. Yes, uh, this is sort of depressing, but uh, we'll uh, have to follow up on this here. I will take a break here in a minute, but uh, start. I want you to think about other things like the uh, trade war and its possible economic collapse, the financial system, uh, how shaky do you think that is? Uh, what, else, uh, what else should be, what, el what other items that do we need to think about? We're not gonna solve these in this short period that we have here, but we can at least uh, set up the standard for what we need to look at. And then in subsequent sh uh, shows, we can propose solutions to those things that are amenable to solutions. If they're predicaments, like worrying about an ice age, for example, that is another end of civilization, the ice age, which comes every you know 20,000 years or so. Last one came 10,000 years ago. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. If the ice age is coming down, there's a sheet of ice a mile high. It got as far as North Carolina last time. Uh, we're, we're cook for a while, we just have to go south and, and avoid it. So the uh, point is things that can be avoided though, we ought to be thinking in terms of uh, solving problems, even if we can't solve predicaments like an ice age. <clears throat> That's quite a ways away. I mean, of course, the sun's gonna actually burn us up in a few hundred million years too. There's other things that, and there's also asteroids coming out of the sky, hitting the earth like it wiped out the, uh, the dinosaurs about uh, 66 million years ago, those, nothing can be done. Uh, so we'll just have to accept that. But things that can be done, like your su intelligence suggestion about limiting uh, population is, is sensible. Uh, let's pause here for a moment here. And uh, uh, well, we're going to not pause. Instead, we're going to pause for, to think about the next session. Uh, anything else that you want to add the next time we have the show? Nothing. Well, let me just mention that there are some movements now on the fringes of society still for people to actually get off the grid, mm -hmm. for people to get back to the way people lived in 1880 or mm -hmm. 1920, mm -hmm. growing their own food, uh, generating their own electricity, having windmills. This is a small okay. but growing movement. Thank you, Dr. King. That, that was a splendid presentation. We're gr terribly grateful. Looking forward to more uh, discussion on these topics in the future. Very good.